The reinventing of the human is basically the establishing of a new story. Since the civilizational developments or the human developments and the articulation of values is generally uh, provided in a story. And when we talk about a paradigm, we are generally involved with a story that identifies the uh, basic structure of life, the basic values, and the uh, basic role of the human in the order of things. So uh, we are faced with the question of story. Our story has become destructive and dysfunctional. That's the simplest way of describing the present, I, I would say. And also, I would say that the story uh, is the principal educational instrument. I would describe education very simply as learning the story. Uh, religion is, uh, is constituted by uh, what, by the lifestyle, by the values that indicated by the story. So I would like to read something I wrote some time ago called The New Story. But the first paragraph identifies how a story functions. And this paragraph was once taken out by somebody I've forgotten, I guess the SRI uh, Institute, when they published something on values and so forth, wanted to explain what a paradigm is or how it functions. It's all a question of story. We're in trouble just now because we do not have a good story. We're in between stories. The old story, the account of how the world came to be and how we fit into it, is not functioning properly. And we have not learned the new story. The old story sustained us for a long time. It shaped our emotional attitudes, provided us with life purpose, energized action, it consecrated suffering, integrated knowledge, guided education. We awoke in the morning and knew where we were. We could answer the questions of our children. We could identify crime, punish criminals. Everything was taken care of because the story was there. It did not make men good. It did not take away the pains and stupidities of life or make for unfailing warmth in human association. But it did provide a context in which life could function in a meaningful manner. Today, however, our traditional story is non-functional in its larger social dimensions, even though some people believe it firmly and act according to its dictates. It works in its limited order and encouraged to us as individuals, yet the dissolution of our institutions and our life programs continues. We see this in every phase of our present society. Aware of the non-functional aspects of the traditional program, some persons have moved on into different modern programs. But these programs, for the most part, have quickly become tangential. Most are revealed as ephemeral, is incapable of sustaining the life situation of this late 20th century. Other persons have returned to the earlier religious fundamentalism, but this too is quickly seen as a sterile gesture. Security is not there. The basic elements in the religious community of the modern world have become trivialized. What we offer our society serves only a temporary function. It simply enables us to keep a semblance of meaning in our institutions and in our public life. And then when we look outside the believing community, we see a society that's also dysfunctional. Even with advanced science and uh, technology, with superb techniques in manufacturing and commerce and communications and computation, our secular society remains without satisfactory meaning or capacity to restrain the violence of its own members. Our miracle machines serve ephemeral purposes. 
So we begin to talk about meaning. Where can we begin? My suggestion is that we begin where everything begins in human affairs with the basic story. The account of how things came to be at all, how they came to be as they are, and how the future of humans can be given some satisfactory direction. We need a story that will educate the human community, heal the community, guide the community. That's the, the basic statement of how I would think of our present uh, situation and the need for a story. Now, in our present sense of the universe, there's a question of what is involved in a working out of our present data. There are several things that I think need to be considered uh, as regards our story. What can be uh, considered is that our stories generally come about, or the vitality of civilizations uh, generally comes about by assimilation processes. We have, in the course of Christianity, uh, particularly clear evidences of this. The early church grew and developed by assimilating the, the wisdom of the world about them. Uh, so we have people like Clement of Alexandria and the Hellenic world. Later, we have Augustine, who assimilated the uh, Neoplatonic vision, which is at the center of a great deal of the Western spiritual development. In fact, it would be very difficult to find any of the mystical developments of the Christian world that was not profoundly influenced by the assimilation of Neoplatonism. Uh, later, we find uh, Thomas assimilating the uh, works of Aristotle, uh, whereas before assimilating the Greek tradition had been mainly a problem of assimilating its Platonic um, orientation and his platonic uh, context, uh, Thomas uh, gave us uh, a capacity to restate our uh, position and our sense of reality, our sense of values by uh, assimilating the Aristotelian uh, vision and providing the Western mind with a discipline associated with the uh, with the works of Aristotle. Uh, then we have gone on into a modern world. Uh, we've gone through Renaissance period. We've gone through uh, a great many things. There are two things that we uh, need to do, I think, by way of assimilation. I've suggested that uh, the two things that we need to assimilate that have not been assimilated properly is, uh, first, there are the un unassimilated elements of what has traditionally been known as paganism. Uh, it is the tribal uh, tradition. Also in this, there would certainly be a large part of the American Indian heritage with their uh, fantastic uh, insight into the uh, functioning of the natural world and the communion with the a spirit world present in the universe about us. That's one of the things, or one of the directions in which our process of assimilation needs to move in order to acquire a, an association with the uh, powers of the, that are available uh, in the world about us. And uh, there's a great deal to be done in that direction. There's one other thing that needs to be done is to assimilate the story of the universe that comes to us through our new instruments of knowing, our empirical instruments of knowing, and particularly from our observational sciences. 
we've been looking at the world. Now, there are several ways of looking uh, at the world. We can look metaphysically, we can look cosmologically. Uh, we have developed particularly the analytical powers of looking, also synthetic powers of looking, but it's only since the uh, around the 17th century, as I mentioned yesterday, that we've really looked at the natural world in this empirical way and in what the type of analysis all peoples have have known the natural world profoundly and have have known it uh, intimately and intuitively. But there's something about our new ways of knowing that's different. Uh, when we uh, work with the stars and develop a story of the time dimension of the emergent universe and the sequence of stages through which life has passed, we know with a certain precision some of the deep mysteries of life that uh, were never known before. Now, other traditions and others of the uh, of the different peoples of the world have known things that we don't know by this method. So uh, we would not claim that this is the the only way in which a, a person can know these deep mysteries of life. But we know them in our modern science in a way uh, that uh, has never been known before, certainly not in the detail that we know. And this is a fantastic uh, mode of knowing, as I've suggested. Uh, science is, in a sense, the yoga of the West. Uh, we've gone through a mechanistic phase, but this mechanistic phase of science and its analytical a phase, its quantitative phase, has been overcome to a large extent, and we're entering into the mystery phase of science. We're entering into a new wisdom phase. This doesn't mean that we are into a, uh, a something that is um, easy to deal with. And it doesn't mean that the mechanistic science is all of a sudden is dissolved. We're still uh, beset by uh, a mess mechanistic mentality that uh, will remain with us for a long time. Uh, because, uh, as Thomas Kuhn has mentioned, scientists are like theologians. Scientists learn their catechism. They learn the elements, the nature of the elements, and so forth. You ask them a question, they give you the catechetical answer. And so the real thinking scientists are as rare as thinking theologians. <laughs> but the, but the uh, inventiveness is, uh, requires a certain uh, insight, a certain special genius or gift, something like poetry, uh, something like music. In any field of human endeavor, there is that special quality of insight that goes with uh, things of significance, whether it's in the realm of knowing or in the realm of making or in the realm of interhuman relationships. There is the question of the, uh, a special genius, a special talent that goes with this. Now, what I'm suggesting is that we need a very special talent that has never existed before. We can be helped by these other traditions, but these other traditions cannot do simply out of their own resources what we have to do. We couldn't do what they did. They can't, couldn't, can't do what we have to do. And we can't do what we need to do without them so that we have uh, an intimacy with the total structure of the past even while we develop our own a contribution, that unique achievement to which we are called specifically. Now, this is something that uh, is unique to ourselves, and we have to discover the, the genius of our own calling. Now, when I mention the fact that we have 
this enormous power of altering the universe that we have altered the planet at uh, such an order of magnitude, it's clear that we are up against ultimacy. Uh, that is, we, when we do what, we, what needs to be done, it has to be done right, because if it's not done right, the consequences are too enormous to think about. It's, a, um, it's up against ultimacy. Now, humans have always lived up against ultimacy, but in the sense of having physical powers at this level, it is something that uh, it's not clear that any other people or any other period ever had precisely this power, or that they did alter the functioning of the biosphere in uh, the way in which we have the power to alter it, and on the order of magnitude. Uh, they may have altered it on a significant degree of magnitude, but uh, we have our own special way of doing it. Now, when we come to uh, establishing the story, it comes back to the question of the story. What is our story? It's a rather uh, amazing story. Uh, we have the, the story of Genesis in our tradition, where we have the uh, let there be light, there's light, and the sun to rule by day and the moon by night, and so forth, the creation of the uh, physical world, the uh, creation of the fishes in the sea and the birds of the air, and the living things upon the earth. Uh, after each of these um, creations, uh, God says, it's good. After creating the uh, sun and the moon, it's good. After creating the living creatures, it's good. After creating uh, trees and plants and so forth, after each stage, it's good. And after the last stage, God says, it's very good. And St. Thomas takes this particularly as an indication that the primary objective of creation is not any particular being, but the total community of life, the total community of the universe that reflects the, and manifests the ultimate mystery, uh, the great uh, uh, reality that is finding expression in uh, the universe. And that is what the universe is. It's a celebration of what might be called the great mystery, uh, the great, uh, some would call it the great spirit, or the great um, joy, the great peace, or the great uh, whatever, or the great wisdom of the, uh, that's too mysterious for us to understand, but uh, with which uh, we must interact. We must interact with the universe. We must interact with the ultimate dynamics of the universe. And so uh, we come to our story. What is our story of this? It's, uh, it's a rather a powerful story. Um, it evolves basically in a sequence of events that uh, begins with a with some trillions of degrees of heat. The ultimate mystery is not present. We can only uh, go back to a certain point, but we can actually uh, hear and be in contact now, even physically, with the beginnings of the universe. Stupendous thing of billions of years. How many billions is not uh, entirely clear, maybe 15, maybe 20, but certainly a very long time. Well, we have a physical uh, communication and experience of this, and what is called the, the background uh, radiation. And we have uh, a story that unfolds basically in a fourfold sequence. The galactic period, um, the shaping of the solar system and planet Earth, then the emergence of life, and then finally of consciousness. 
in its human phase. We would need to suppose a basic uh, something uh, capable of evolving into consciousness from the beginning, something that is not revealed to us. There are dimensions of the universe that are progressively revealed to us, and we must read this story both forward and backwards. The difficulty of the scientists is that they read the story in an analytical way backwards to the component elements of the universe and say these particles are the reality and holes are adventitious. Or that these particles with minimal inner articulation of the reality and the later articulation in human consciousness is, uh, is somewhat unreal or it's only a random activity of purely physical elements. Uh, it needs to be read the other way. That is, that the human is articulating the deep dimensions of the universe that existed from the beginning. And the story of the universe is the story of the progressive emergence of a mode of articulation whereby the universe is able to reflect on itself, to commune with itself, to celebrate itself in conscious experience of itself and of the, its deep mystery. So that celebratory intercommunion of the universe with itself in and through human consciousness as a high phase of its expression is the story. So it's a story of celebration. And it's in that sense, it identifies with all the great stories on, out of which humans and human communities have articulated their basic sense of reality, their basic sense of values, the basic direction of their lives, the basic sense of what things are all about. And this is what enables them to do what I mentioned uh, uh, before in here. Uh, uh, something I'd like to repeat. What did the story do? It shaped our emotional attitudes. And this story uh, shapes our emotions in that a sense of participation in stupendous sequence of events, but which are caught up in an overarching unity of events that uh, is celebratory in its nature. It provided us with life purpose. What is our life purpose? It's our life purpose is to fulfill the role that human consciousness is called upon to fulfill, which is to enable the planet to celebrate its existence or enable the universe to celebrate its existence as manifestation of ultimate mystery and as expression of ultimate uh, um, wisdom, beauty, power, and so forth. It's a self-recognition of the universe, of its own beauty and joy and movement and so forth. It's why nothing is complete until it, this takes place. And that's why humans are so absolutely important. And it's why geology that studies just the physical structure of the planet is an abstraction. There is no planet without the human. It's, and if you're going to study geology, it must be recognized that the human is a part of the geology. It's integral with the geology. It's integral with the chemistry of the planet. It's integral with the biology or the life systems of the planet. They are not, uh, are not uh, we cannot understand them adequately unless we include the, the relationship with the human and the way in which they return to themselves in and through human consciousness. And so this is uh, the sense of life purpose and energizes action. And this question of action, of energy, is so absolutely important. In fact, Teilhard, throughout the later years of his life, was particularly concerned with 
with energetics. He said that one of the things that's most needed is the science of human energetics, because the dying down of the zest for life is the greatest danger to the whole human venture and to the whole venture of the planet. The dying down of the zest for life. And this comes to us spontaneously within our being, and we can observe it particularly in children. That's why children are so utmostly important to ourselves and to our whole life style, our whole life program, because they reveal to us something that we tend to forget. They reveal to us a, the deep spontaneities and interest in existence. And it consecrated suffering. We must go through uh, a great deal of, um, of suffering, of pain. A certain there's a, a deep uh, pain in existence. And with consciousness, as uh, somebody like uh, Jung would say, every rise in consciousness brings with it, uh, it's painful. It comes with a certain amount of pain. Pay I would say the same thing. There is something to be paid for every advance in uh, development of life. And if we can appreciate some of this, uh, it will enable us to uh, sustain that and to sustain even those deep mysteries of suffering that we can find no obvious uh, meaning for. But once there is understanding and meaning in suffering, it can be endured. And in many cases, it eliminates the pain, uh, to a, at least to a very large extent. It integrates knowledge, guided education. We awoke in the morning and knew where we were. We awake in the morning now, we're not quite sure. We can answer the questions of our children, we could identify crime, punish criminal, everything was taken care of because the story was there. But that's our problem now. And this is the problem of the transition that we are making from a, what I would call a spatial um, consciousness of the universe to a time developmental mode of consciousness. This is uh, not so absolutely exclusive, these two, uh, as might appear at times, but there is a sense in which in a spatial mode of consciousness, everything can be clear. It's not that there's not dynamism and movement and so forth, but it's not exactly the type of developmental sequence that, that is available in a type of developmental process. But when a person's in what might be called a spatial mode, the spatial consciousness had to come first. It's like a child, uh, per perspective. Uh, a child does not get perspective, depth perspection, um, uh, perception until later in life, uh, well, uh, or at least it's not the first thing that comes. At first, it's a rather two-dimensional, and then space perception. I tell you, I once mentioned that one of our difficulties is overcoming the illusion of nearness. Uh, like the stars, they don't seem to be so far away. They are way away. The Earth doesn't seem so uh, so old, it's here and fresh and lively. But it has a great story. It has a long history. Uh, and it's also uh, this movement into time developmental processes is, uh, is both exciting and disconcerting. Because whereas you have a Mandela symbolism, which is so powerful in spatial mode of consciousness and in all modes of consciousness, it, uh, plays a very great role, but it is particularly a spatial, a spatial metaphor, a spatial metaphor of, uh, that gives a way of integrating the physical, the, um, the human, and the uh, transhuman forces, and uh, bringing them to a presence to each other and a communication of power. Uh, mutual sharing in a common 
uh, presence, a common power, a common creative uh, creativity. And in all creative moments, that's what happens. The, uh, the, the uh, transhuman powers, the powers of the physical, natural world, the powers of the human come together. Great art is created, literature, dance, music, uh, the great metaphysical insights, the great religious experiences all come out of that type of thing, which is associated with, particularly with what might be called um, a Mandela symbol, the symbol of the journey to the center. That's what we are doing. We're going to the center. However, um, things are almost too clear in what I would call a spatial mode of consciousness. That is, um, we, we know uh, we can establish moral codes. We have a uh, natural law that says everything in a space is what it is. It's also participating in everything else, but basically its role is clearly articulated. And you can have ethical codes, you can have uh, that are very ethical codes that are very clear, and a person can know where they are in a spatial world, like in geography, you can know in a certain sense where you are. But when you go to a time development of the universe, you have a difficulty. Because things are coming into being, they do not exist, there is not the clarity uh, in an abiding way. There is a certain um, creativity. The world is being created at every moment. We're creating a new, with every act, we're creating a new morality. With every act, we are creating a, a new world of beauty or art or, or of truth. And, but also, we are lacking in normative references such as we have in a more spatial mode of consciousness, as I would describe. Now, um, there's a lot of discussion can take place on this point, but when a person enters into a time developmental world, you, we move from a morality of stasis to a morality of movement where well, the norm of reference is the creativity inherent in the emergent universe, which is the primary consideration. What enables the creativity to take place? It's not exactly uh, acting according uh, to a fixed nature, because it's, uh, the fixation of things is not there. And so we have very different problems. And also, there's a certain, tends to be a certain uh, confusion because creativity uh, comes uh, basic out of certain chaos and that is where our creativity has to be at the present time and it's the function of contemporary chaos to provide the backgrounds for our creativity uh, to which we are called but uh, to establish a context of action and a context of reality a context of value uh, one of the things that we need to do particularly is to know the story. Because to know the story, to know the, the arc or the trajectory of the past becomes extremely important in knowing how to create the future. And it gives us direction. Our direction is contained to a large extent in the sequence of events that have brought us to where we are at the present time. And we can see this in our personal life to a large extent. There's a trajectory in our lives. And we have to be guided by that experience to know how to move on from one thing to another, how to create the next phase of our existence. As we um, know the story of, of what has uh, transpired in the past uh, phases of human development, uh, we have the indication of, of where we're going. So uh, my suggestion is that we, we bear, be very careful to learn the story. Uh, the story has to be a fascinating story. That's the other aspect of the thing. And the evidences of the validity of the story are largely constituted by the extent, does it really fascinate? 
does it really um, convince in such a commanding way that we can um, live life and create in that context? Are we excited by the story? Uh, one of the difficulties that we have in our uh, that we have had in the recent past is that the story has been told simply in its physical dimensions. The scientists have given us a quantitative story and not a spiritual story. It has not been a, the real story of consciousness. It has been a story of, of randomness and uh, to some extent meaninglessness. Uh, and in fact, if a person reads uh, something um, about science, uh, for a scientist occasionally you read the story that the more we know about the universe, the more insignificant humans appear. That, that can be a very inspiring position. <laughs> that the more you know about the universe, the more insignificant we are. Well, obviously, that can't be the story. So, uh, what is needed to, is, to, is to find a, a deeper perception of the story. And what has happened is that the difficulty is not the data of the story, but the uh, attitude toward the story and the limited powers of assimilation and interpretation of the data of the story. And that is the way in which we get into what I would uh, consider to be the new story. That is the new paradigm, that is the context in which uh, the human venture can continue into the future with some uh, expectation of providing for ourselves and for the, our children. Uh, and ex that level of excitement and fulfillment in our human existence that makes life possible for us. So I have suggested that we uh, consider this in its uh, galactic phase. In fact, my own library now is uh, is in this sequence: uh, the galactic um, uh, phase, the um, the Earth, the shaping of the Earth, of life and consciousness, and then the different phases of consciousness, and the with a special reference to the phase that. I would call the ecological phase or the phase of the intercommunion, a phase of the great intercommunion, where the great uh, luminous quality of the universe uh, becomes radiant or is perceived and experienced in its radiance throughout the, the natural world and throughout the, the human. And so that uh, we have, in that sense, a a radiant world in which we can live, in which we can find uh, some basic fulfillment. I have, uh, and then once a person has that basic outline, uh, my suggestion is that, that it can be interpreted, and I put the, the whole story, as I would consider it, on this page. <laughs> so that I'm not uh, asking that we read 20 volumes or even 20 pages, that you can reduce it as all stories. You can put it down. Any story can be written in one page or a thousand pages uh, if a person uh, knows the story.